Alright, so I know that many of you have a scientific paper that's due in lab and I know that this typically stresses a lot of students out because they've maybe never done one before. I'll tell you right now that you can find tips on how to write the scientific paper along with um, information regarding essentially what your instructor may be looking for, examples, stuff like that on my website. So if you go to the lab page of the website there should be a tab um, in the nav bar or also in the section underneath the countdown clock called scientific paper that will provide more information. This tutorial is specifically geared towards showing you how easy it is to kind of make your scientific papers formatting clean and super easy to edit. So what we're going to do is as always we're going to start off with a brand new document. So here I'm going to start with a document. I'm going to go ahead and open. You'll have to pardon the internet connection here is a little slow. Um, so it might just take it a few seconds here to get opened up and, and started. Alright, so here's my document. Um, just for ease of use, I'm going to call this Styles Example. Alright, so as you may be aware, your scientific paper is going to be divided into a multitude of different sections. So let's say that I have what's called my abstract here. Um, I have my introduction, my materials and methods section. And then finally, I also, let's say, have my results. I know there's, there's also discussion, but I just want to work with these four for now. So under each of these sections, you have essentially uh, your text that you're going to type in. So these are going to be your paragraphs for the abstract or the intro. Um, this is where the materials and methods section would go, and then this is where the results section would go. Alright, so a couple of things. First and foremost, these four portions here that I'm tapping my cursor on and highlighting are supposed to be headings for these sections, which means they need to look different. So, you know, when I was a student, I made the mistake of, of thinking in this manner. Okay, I'm going to make this a heading, so I'm going to change it. It needs to be Times New Roman. And it's worth mentioning that your instructor's formatting may be a little different than what I require my students to do. So I believe I use Times New Roman, size 14 font, and bold. Make sure that's what your instructor's asking for. If they're asking for a different font, don't sit there and say, Professor Garcia said I need to do this. This is for students who take my lab when I teach lab. Check what your instructor told you you need to do. If they told you instead of Times New Roman you're doing Arial font, then you need to make sure that this is an aerial font. But the fact of the matter is going to be whatever font it is, whatever size it is, whatever formatting it is, let's say that this is what I want a header to look like. Now what I used to do in college was I would say, okay, there's my abstract. Now I gotta go do the exact same thing for my introduction. So I do Times New Roman, and I go to 14, and I go to bold, and I do this again and again and again. And the sad part is that takes up so much time. Yeah, it's not that big of a deal here, but if you've got a really long paper, you have to sift through each and every one of these and make those changes. And in the grand scheme of things, that can take up and eat up a lot of time. So, this is when I discovered what are known as styles. And I discovered these about two years ago, and I've never looked back since. And I'd always known of their existence, I just didn't really know how to use them until I started to sit down and teach myself what it, what it meant and, and what I could do with these. So in Google Drive, the styles are in a very easy to find location. They're here in the ribbon, the toolbar. 
and they're right here. So currently this says normal text. And what this is basically saying is all the stuff I have here started out with a basic style called normal text. And that normal text style was Arial size 11 font with no formatting done. Okay? But I don't want this to be that normal text. Instead, if I look and click here, it gives me several other options too. I've got a title, I've got a subtitle, heading one, heading two, and heading three. So let's say that I wanted to make this heading one. Okay, so I want heading one to have the format of Times New Roman, size 14, bold. Well, the mistake I made when I was first playing with styles was I was like, okay, well, here it is, heading one, I want to do it. And I click this, and it changed that to what heading one was listed to. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to do that. So that was the learning curve for me initially with styles. I know it might sound silly, but I think a lot of people probably do this. They're like, well, I want this style to mimic what I had before. So let me back up, back to that style, okay? So instead of clicking heading one and saying this, because all you're doing when you click on these is you're saying, I want this text that I have to convert to this style. Well, what I want to do with heading one is I want to convert heading one style to match what I have here for the abstract. So what I'm going to do, is I'm going to click on this style panel, and instead of clicking heading one, I'm going to click the arrow here, and I'm going to choose to update heading one to match that style. So there it is. This is now heading one, and if I look at my heading one now, it's been changed to match that of the abstract. So let's go to introduction. Now I can highlight, or the cool thing about styles is as long as your cursor is on the same line as the text, you will apply that style to that text. Now we're not going to see introduction change here because heading one already matches that of introduction. But you'll notice now when I click anywhere in introduction, it says heading one, whereas before it had said normal text. Now let me show you the real value of styles. Here I have materials and methods, and it is not styled like these two. So what I'm going to do is with my cursor somewhere here, I don't even have to highlight, I can just have it on the same line. At the end, at the beginning, in the middle, doesn't matter. I'm going to choose heading one, and it magically changes materials and methods to match that. If I do the same thing here for results, it does the same thing for results. So there we go. Okay, so let's apply the same principle here to what I've got on this first one. So this is currently set to my normal text style, but my students have to write their body portions in Times New Roman, size 12, with no other formatting, no bold, no italics, or underlined, and just go with pure black text. So I'm going to change this so that it matches that parameter, and then I'm going to go here in the Styles palette, and I'm going to click the arrow and choose to update. And what you should see are these three paragraphs will also change to match. And so there we go. Notice these all now changed to Times New Roman. And that's because these had originally been set to normal text, which now is Times New Roman size 12, no format. Now, why does this matter? You know, why, why can't you just go back through and say, highlight everything and say Times New Roman size 12, and then just come back and change your headings? Well, you can. But here's the other problem. Let's say, for whatever reason, you then decide that maybe you're, you have a little more freedom in how you're creating your document and, and your instructor is like, you know what, you can choose whatever color you want to for your headings. You don't have to use black text. And so now you're in a, a position where you're wanting to go back through and you're wanting to change all of the text color for your headings. Okay. Well, if I was going to do that here, I'd have to, I would have to highlight everything and let's say I want to change everything to an orange color. Just because. Why not, right? Well, I'd have to highlight this guy change it to orange, then I have to go to introduction, highlight introduction, change it to orange, and do that again and again and again. Well, here we see again the benefit of styles. I can highlight my abstract, which is now an orange text, so I change one of these four elements, and then I can go to heading one, update to match, and all of those, wherever they occur in the paper, automatically match. There's another instance of this. Let me back up. Okay. Notice right now, if I have a paragraph, so let me just go ahead and copy this text a few more times so that it turns it into a paragraph. Notice that my text currently is single-spaced. And let's say that for my paragraphs, I actually want to do double-spacing. So I'm going to change this 
So this paragraph, which is normal text, is double-spaced. But if I come over to these, introduction, materials, and methods, whatever they are, they're still single-spaced. And that could be a pain, too, because let's say that my titles don't have to be double-spaced, but my paragraphs do. Well, what I can do is I can highlight a paragraph that's double-spaced, or even a section of the paragraph that's double-spaced, and I can come to normal text, and again, update normal text to match. And magically now, my introduction paragraph is double-spaced. And if I copy and paste this here, what you'll find is my materials and methods is now also double-spaced, and my results section would be as well. So I can copy and paste this, and again, you'll notice double-spacing. So styles is great because it means that if you, can, if you build your document using styles initially, any changes you make in the grand scheme of things will automatically be reflected as you update those styles. Now, this brings up one other important point I want to raise um, because I was doing this a lot when I was a student. Let's say that, I'll ignore the abstract because it's going to be shorter, um, but let's say that you know, I've got a, a, a large introductory paragraph with a few more paragraphs here, and let's say that your instructor gives you parameters where you're required to start each new section on its own page. So in other words, the abstract tapes, takes up its own page, and then the introduction has to go on its own page. I don't construct my papers this way. I let my students start the introduction uh, with just a single line between their abstract, where their abstract ends, and where their introduction begins. So this is essentially what a, a scientific paper for me and my lab would look like. But maybe your instructor tells you your abstract has to be on its own page, and then your introduction has to start a new page. Well, what I used to do when I was in college was I would say, okay, I've got to do that. So, um, you know, I would finish my abstract here and maybe have my introduction starting here. I'm like, okay, well, it's time then. I've got to go return, return, return all the way down until I finally get to that new page. So there, hooray, I did it. My introduction is now on a new page. But then I would think of something and I'm like, man, I really want to change my abstract a little bit. I came up with a couple of new sentences I want to add that I really think bring the abstract together. So I would add in those new sentences. And those new sentences would take up a few extra lines. And the problem then I would find is that would push my abstract down. Okay? Or I'm sorry, my introduction down. Or maybe my abstract was too long and I'm like, oh, I really need to delete a few of these sentences. So I would delete sentences. And then what I would find is my introduction starts shifting upward. And so it makes all of this extra work I have to do when I go to edit my paper and make sure I'm ready to turn it in. So rather than using the return key to go down the page, we're going to employ another technique that I utilize that's called a page break. So I have my abstract running directly into my introduction, and I want to separate these on different pages. So with the cursor in front of introduction but on the same line, I'm going to click insert and I'm going to come here to page break. Now, you can also use a shortcut, which you'll see when you go to do this. So on Apple computers, it would be command plus enter. And that's going to introduce a page break. So what that says is, from this point onward, we're going to start on a new page. So here's why this is so cool. I can now go to abstract, and I can copy my abstract. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this. Okay. And you'll notice it does add in a couple of extra lines, which if I want to, I can delete. There we go. But what I can do now is I can add in extra sentences that build out the abstract, but notice it has no effect whatsoever on my introduction. So I can essentially now edit. I can make this abstract as short as I want to. I can make it really, really long. And effectively, as long as I don't go off of this page, my introduction is not going to be affected at all. So I'm going to go ahead and just show you what I mean here. I'm going to delete this. Oh, sorry. Not delete that, but delete this portion here. There we go. Build this out. I accidentally deleted the page break there. That was not good. But notice, I'm making this abstract essentially as long as I want to go. I can even start new paragraphs, and it doesn't affect the introduction until I get to a new page. And once my text spills over onto that new page, now all of a sudden, 
the introduction winds up on a brand new page. So as long as I don't mess with this page break, which you'll know, you'll be at the end of your text and if you press the right arrow, you suddenly jump. This is the page break. If I delete that page break, all of a sudden I bring the introduction back onto the page. Now if that happens, very easy to fix. Just go in front of your introduction again, do insert and choose page break. And there we go. Once again, I'm right back where I need to be. Okay? So, super easy. And again, you'll notice now if I highlight a bunch of this text from the abstract and I delete it, suddenly my introduction has caught right back up to where I need to be. So I can go to the introduction and I can do the same thing with materials and methods. Insert, page break, and again, voila, my materials and methods are now on a new page and my introduction is up in its own area, so if I wanted to build on this introduction, I could add in some more paragraphs, and as I do, the materials and methods section is always going to be pushed down. So what this really allows you to do is it allows you to keep the sections of whatever paper you're writing, scientific or otherwise, separated from one another, and also it will keep them to where they're always moving in accordance to where the other one is. Okay? So that's essentially how page breaks and styles work. Styles, again, make it incredibly easy for us to update certain aspects of the document to match. So if I've dictated all of these styles, I can change the color of one to red. And if I update heading one to match that, then everywhere I go and there's a heading, it's going to be red. Okay, control Z that back. There we go. And then, of course, page breaks make it to where my sections are cleanly defined and separated. So that's essentially all you need to know for Google Documents on how to utilize styles and page breaks. Good luck with your paper.